Hi folks, um, so this is on chapter 5, Adapting Instruction, and you're going to see um, a lot of um, overlap um, from last week. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these slides just because um, I, I want to keep this presentation under 15 minutes, and um, sometimes um, I go over and I don't want to do that. All right, so I want to just stop here for a moment and, and just look at these three stages of learning, acquisition, maintenance, and generalization. Acquisition is the initial learning that's acquiring the understanding and knowledge um, or a, a ability to do a task. Maintenance is being able to recall you know, something and be able to say that or being able to do something. Generalization is the applicability or transfer to similar situations and problems. And this can be a breakdown in, here in, in lots of different places. Um, and, and so we have to think about the, the academic problems can occur at, at, at the basic skill level in reception of knowledge, such as listening and reading, or expression of knowledge, such as speaking and writing, um, any kind of the communication processes. It might be in rote skills of um, uh, word recognition, handwriting, spelling, math facts, or computation. It could be in conceptual skills of uh, uh, reading comprehension, uh, written expression, problem solving. And then we think of these gen generally in terms of elementary education, but these can persist into high school as well, and so if basic skills problems persist, it can interfere with content learning. It really exacerbates the problem. Um, poor organizational skills and poor study, study habits can also contribute, but you know, this, it's this, this is accumulation of, of skill deficit that can really, um, really affect a, a student's work. Let's skip these slides as well, because you can look at those yourself. I'm going to skip these as well. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory. I want to get to um, this. So we talked about differentiated instruction last week, and so this is not unfamiliar to you. We can differentiate, that means change up the content, what, what we actually teach, and how, and, but the process also of how the student, we teach it and how the students learn it, the products that they produce to demonstrate their learning, and then the ways and the situations in which they learn that material. Universal design is, is kind of important here. I want to just stop for a second and make sure you understand it. It's, it's, it's approach to design of all products and environments so that it's usable to everyone um, to the greatest extent possible. And the, the um, example your book gives is the cu curb cut, and I'll let you read about that as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about instruction steps. This um, is very important, and I would, would and when you have to do a lesson plan for later on in this uh, particular course, um, this will be very important to you, and I want to, you to refer to this, okay? Um, so there's, um, excuse me, just let me get my paper opened here. There's, uh, this is on page 90 and 91 of your text. So first of all, you're going to have to select the learning task, or, you know, and then decide on the scope and sequence, how much and, and what, and what how these tasks will line up, and what will you do to get students to that learning task. This is really backward design of, of what do I want students to do, um, lining it up with a standard, which we'll talk about later on, and then, and then what's the scope? You know, how do I get students there? You need to find out what students already know and what they can do, um, and then you have to find out their current interest and needs. Because we want to make students, we want to keep students interested, in, and if we don't, uh, we don't connect the learning to what they're interested in, we tend to lose them, okay? And finding out what students already know and can do is very much RTI of that sort of universal screening. Um, second part is presentation, okay? You, how are you going to get students to that task? Through lectures and class activities, readings, whatever it is you're going to do to help students acquire skills and information. Um, this also involves activating schema and building background knowledge, okay? Schema theory is, is the idea of what someone knows about a particular thing. If you're teaching um, students a skill or concept for which they have no context, you're not going to have to build some background knowledge for that. Once you've built that background knowledge, then you're going to model and explain, and then you're going to provide directions for the task. Now, modeling and explain is not just one step. That may be several steps, maybe several ways of modeling, um, several different kinds of ways of ex explaining what you want students to do. And then they're going to practice the task. You're not just going to turn them loose to do an independent um, you know, task. You're going to have guided practice with feedback. And here you're going to use Vygotsky's concept of gradual release of responsibility. I do, you watch. I do, you help. You do, I help. You do, I watch. The example I always use is that of my father teaching me how to change the oil in my car when I was a teenager. You know, he called me out to the garage and says, okay, you're going to learn to do this. He did it, and I watched him several times 
asking questions along the way, and he was giving me instruction as he was going along of what he was doing and why he was doing it. He was giving me the vocabulary I needed um, and so forth. And then he decided that it was time for me to help, and so I did. Um, specific points along the way, he would instruct me on what he wanted me to do, and I would do it. Sometimes I had to ask questions. Sometimes he had to explain it again, but I helped. And then eventually, it was he turned, wanted me to do it, but he, I wasn't quite ready to let me do it on my own. So you do it and I'll help you. So I became the primary doer of the task, but he was there to help. You know, if I did something wrong, he would explain why it was wrong and show me how to do it. I would do it again, you know, I would, I would forget something and I'd ask him and he'd help me to do it, all right? And then finally, we get to the you do, I watch part, which is mastery. Um, this is where students perform the task independently. And did I do it right the first time? No, I didn't. Um, and I didn't. So we had to go back to, you know, some of the you do I help until I, I got it. Eventually I did, but it was several sort of recursive moves of Vygotsky's uh, gradual release before I was able to actually do this on my own. Um, so then we get to application. Um, can students transfer this skill or knowledge to another aspect of learning? Um, could I, from changing the oil in my car, go change the oil in somebody else's car? Yes, I could. Sometimes I'd have to do a little bit of investigating, but I could do it. So I was able to transfer the skill. It wasn't just in this one particular context that I could do this skill. I could do it someplace else. This is often the forgotten aspect of teaching. We forget to help students understand how they can apply this skill or this knowledge to something else. Okay, so principles of instruction. Um, again, you're going to select the appropriate learning task. You're going to break it into teachable subcomponents. You're going to use systematic instructional procedures. You're going to consider speed and accuracy, uh, both of your teaching and of student engagement. You're going to maximize engaged time. This is bell-to-bell -bell teaching. This is using all the time well and not wasting any of it. You're going to give clear task um, requirements. Make sure students understand what you want them to do. And then select, um, um, provide, excuse me, provide consequences for successful task performance. What will students get? Um, will they get a grade? Will they get um, uh, some sort of, of, of uh, carrot? You know, will they get some sort of reward? What is it that students get for successful task performance? And then you're going to check for maintenance and generalization. Are they getting it and can they apply it to other things? If change is needed, then you're going to try the least intrusive intervention first. Again, your RT, knowledge of RTI will come in very, very handy here. Um, so how do we go about gathering data about instruction? First of all, we're going to determine the student's current level of performance. Again, this is very much um, RTI, the universal screening. What do students know about this particular task? You're going to evaluate their progress, and you're going to analyze the reasons for task failure. This is error analysis. If you see that all students um, did not do well on a particular task, it may be the method of teaching. You may have to go back and re-examine what you did and how you did it and alter that. If you see that just a few people um, failed this particular aspect of the, the lesson, then you can do an analysis to see and why or do um, another screening to see what's going on here. So what are some of the strategies for adapting instruction? Again, we've talked about this um, in the, the differentiation uh, from gifted and talented. You can modify materials and activities. You can change your teaching procedures. You can alter the task requirements, or you can select an alternative task. Oftentimes, um, one of the things that we have to modify are our tests, like, like accommodations. The federal law requires that for statewide and district level tests, there are three options. Students can take the same test as grade level peers. They can take the same test with one or more changes or accommodations, or there can be an alternative assessment procedure. Um, but you can also make accommodations for teacher design tests as well. So there are these types of accommodations for all tests the ways in which directions or instructions are given. It may be that the directions are written and a student needs to have them read to them. Demonstrations. It may be that a student needs to have someone show him or her how this test works, you know, where the pages are, where do you stop, you know, what, what, what is each piece of this test asking me to do. Sometimes students are overwhelmed with several different um, 
testing procedures within one test, like multiple choice or true or false or constructed responses. Time limits. Um, this is one of the most um, widely used um, accommodations in, in that many students um, have, are given extra time. So if the regular time is 30 minutes, oftentimes students are given an extra 15 minutes, okay? So a half time or even double time. Presentation mode, sometimes the, the student does need to see the test. Perhaps it's on a bigger screen to accommodate visual problems. Um, it might be that an educational technician um, is with the student to help present the test. Response mode. Maybe um, most tests ask for a written response, perhaps an uh, accommodation is an oral response. Aids, um, this could be anything from a computer to a calculator um, to a screen reader, um, all kinds of different ways. Prompts and cues, again, these could be delivered by an educational technician um, that is helping the student when he or she gets stuck, um, not by providing an answer, but by, by prompting the student of where to go next, you know. How, how about um, you think about doing this? Feedback, um, positive reinforcement, and physical location. Oftentimes taking a test in a, a room with other students is distracting. Sometimes a student needs to be alone um, where it's quiet. Sometimes a student needs to, to be you know, in a resource room or a library or any other um, physical accommodation. And so then we just get to things to remember, and I'm not going to go through all of these with you. Um, again, I want to emphasize that this, this chapter really does piggyback um, with the one on um, gifted and talented students, but it's also going to be an important chapter for you when you get to the end of the semester and construct a lesson plan. So, so bookmark this somehow, or put a sticky in there, or put something in your notebook about chapter five, adapting instruction, so that when we do get to the um, creating the lesson plan, you'll have some context for this. I'll give you more instruction and I'll give you more information, but this is a, a good uh, chapter to begin thinking about that lesson plan that you're going to do. So with that, um, I am going to say have a great day and I'll talk to you soon.